Hello, hello. Happy Friday. Woohoo. Wow. What a week. What a week. Do you want to know some absolutely delicious summer recipes to cook this weekend? Do you want to know what to do with that abundance of squash coming out of the garden? Do you want to know how to store tomatoes? Do you want to know what to do with all this delicious summer produce? Well, of course you do. Y'all welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Virginia Willis. This is Cookbooks with Virginia. This is a cookbook celebration that happens every Friday at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook and on YouTube. And then a little bit later in the afternoon, we're going to upload it to IGTV. So the most awesome part about it is that I get to talk to people who've written these great cookbooks. And the second most awesome part about it is that you get to join me. So this week, it's been a really busy week and I've got lots to share with you, but our guest today is Jonathan Bardenick. Um, he has written this gorgeous book called Simple Summer, and it is exactly this collection of recipes that you need for summer and you need to celebrate as we head towards the end of summer. So let us please welcome Jonathan to the show. Here we go. Hey, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Virginia. Oh, I'm just thrilled to pieces. Well, I am so excited. We've already got some folks joining us. Yay. Hey, Gail. Gail from Atlanta is here, and it's so great to have her here today. So, so Jonathan, um, tell our viewers and tell the folks uh, with, with watching Cookbooks Virginia just a little bit about yourself and, and how it came to be that you have written this beautiful book. Thank you. I'm a Washington, D.C. based storyteller, cook, and author. I got my start 10 years ago, uh, July 30th, in fact, oh, wow. doing live cooking demos at Historic Eastern Market in D.C., using the fresh produce there and showing people what to do with it and how to have more fun in their own kitchens. And over the last 10 years, I've, I've written four books now uh, and had a new TV show launched just this past May. Yay, that's awesome. Okay, so where can people see your television show? Tell them where to tell them more where to find that. There's a, a great LGBTQ network called Revry, R E V R Y, and you can watch it anywhere that you stream TV. So you can download the app on your Apple TV, your smart TV, your iPhone, uh, or you can watch it through your browser on your laptop or your tablet. I know it's so crazy, right? So like I do that work with Food Network Kitchen and I've been doing that this week and we were talking about that before and um, it's a digital streaming app. You know, everyone's like, what channel? I'm like, no, no channel. <laughs> what is this word? Chanel. I know Chanel. That's my lipstick. But, you know, um, so increasingly it's it's smart TV. It's using apps. And, um, and then even if you... I mean, you can cast it. You can look at it on your phone and cast it to your television. It's a, it, even yeah. even I can figure it out. So, well, congratulations on that. That is awesome. I want people to make sure to go check that out. Um, and I, I haven't had a chance to watch any episodes, but I'm going to definitely make sure to do it. So that's super cool. Super cool. Oh, and I have to stop for a second. Happy birthday. Thank you. That's awesome. So happy birthday. All right. So, well, here we go. There's my mama. Hello. It's mama. Hey, mama. Hi, mama. He's a, he's a mama. He's a mama. He loves his mama too. We've been having a, some mama love and um, we've got Beverly here who always says hello to my mama. So that's awesome. So, okay, Jonathan, the, you know, summer, um, summer is just such a wonderful time for cooking. And I know that you're in D.C. and I have been to some of those incredible markets. And I know that right now you're up in, in Western Massachusetts and I have been to some of those incredible markets. So what what was it what was it that made you want to write a simple summer cookbook? This is one of my favorite seasons of the year to cook in. You know, for me, cooking is ultimately about joy and connection, sharing it with mm -hmm. the people who we love in our lives. And summer makes it so easy to do that. I feel like the ingredients do most of the work in the kitchen, right? Yeah. We don't, uh, simple recipes, yeah. take these flavors that have already developed and turn them into great food. The, the decorating is done by nature out in our gardens. And so all we need to do is just hit the kitchen for a few minutes with that garden farm market fresh food, and then really lean into sharing time with friends and family. No, and that's so true, right? Like some of the, some of the, some things you almost barely have to cook. Right. Like, you know, 
it's just sort of amazing. Everything is so fresh and vibrant. And if you're able to get it at the farmer's market or if you're able to get it from your own garden. Um, I was just uh, looking at your roasted peach recipe with the, the almond crumble. I mean, there's a rest, right? The peaches are doing most of the work. You're yeah. just dressing up with a little bit of crunch on top. And No, thank yeah. you. No, that's a great recipe. That recipe has an interesting lineage. So I saw it on Instagram from Smitten Kitchen, right? And I love her content. And I saw it and it was, I was scrolling through and all of a sudden I was like, ooh, screen grab. And then I went later to read her blog post. She had been inspired by Nigel Slater, who's the food writer for The Guardian and or Telegraph, English, a UK paper. And his recipes are super simple. You know, his, if you're familiar with his work, I'm sure, but you know, his recipes are just like that, like five ingredients, which remind me of a lot of your recipes, right? Just letting, letting the ingredients sing. So y'all, let me show you, um, please go to my Instagram page and look at this, look for this handsome fella on the cover and you're going to like me and you're going to like Jonathan and then you're going to enter to win a, a, a signed copy of his amazing book. So, okay. Peach quesadilla. Tell me about that. I'm going to bring up the peaches first because I'm a Georgia peach. I, one of my favorite dishes. And in fact, talking about moms, this is one my mom uses for entertaining all summer long. Right. So uh, one of the things, and, and you know, this that I find about fruit is when we play a little bit to the acidic notes, it works so well in savory dishes. Yep. And so you get a little bit of some spicy chorizo, some pork sausage in there. I had some Chinese five spice, which gives us some of that warm depth and complexity. Again, with one ingredient, not a whole lot of work. And some, some sauteed uh, onions on top of that cheddar cheese. And those peaches soften up just a little bit using super ripe summer peaches anyways. So it comes together quickly and you get that sweet, salty, hot, tangy dish. And I'm, I'm starving. I know I'm getting hungry just talking about it. Well, I love how smart you are with Chinese five spice, right? Because that ingredient is readily available in most grocery stores now, right? It's And you don't have to go to an Asian market. You don't have to order it online. It is actually sort of, I think McCormick's makes one. So it's available in like mass uh, mass supermarkets. And, and that spice adds so much interest to food. And, and what I'm realizing as you're talking through this and we're looking at this, this effectively is a replacement for Chinese sausage, which is harder to find. Right. And you do have to go to the Asian market. And sometimes it's like not always written in English or translated. And it's a little bit more like, Oh, am I buying the right thing? Or I'm going to kill my family. And, um, Anyway, so good for you for making those adjustments for, for home cooks. You know, for me, I, I, I got my start doing live demos. And one of the great things about that is you are right there with your audience. You know, I, I have found over the last year and a half when we're home and I'm putting more content online that I, I really miss that immediate feedback. Somebody is, if I'm at a market, someone's standing in front of me going, I don't know what that ingredient is or where right, to find right, it. Or that right, step right. seems complicated to me. Or this flavor is amazing. You should make sure that everyone in the world has this recipe on hand. No, it's true. It's true. All right. Well, let's talk about it a little bit more. So and I always laugh because I used to live in Massachusetts near where you are. And, you know, peach season is ending here. Peach season ended like, I don't know, maybe almost two weeks ago. Our yeah. summer starts early, right? It's just hitting right here. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. And then I'm not going to, I'm. this is, this is not a size battle. Okay. I'm not going to try to get into a competition, but I will point out to you that Georgia peaches are significantly larger than Massachusetts peaches. They are. And usually sweeter. I am. Yeah. <laughs> and when I lived up there, I was like, that's a peach. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not an apricot. That looks like an apricot to me. DC is taking me halfway to Georgia and I can see the difference just there. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, that was so interesting with what we were talking about yesterday about like the okra, right? Like, um, like okra is a big summer thing and it used to not be up in the Northeast, but now it is. So, oh, I love this. Vegetables aren't candy. No, they're not. It is not candy, but you're right. You can teach kids to, you can teach kids to like vegetables. All right. I, the rest of the story that that recipe is talking about is a zucchini meatloaf. Uh, yeah. So I, I love meatloaf, but meatloaf is not usually a summery dish, right? It, it right. kind of feels kind of heavy. It's great in the, the fall and the winter when you need something hearty. So I there are a million recipes that my mom made when we were growing up to, to use up zucchini. 
Uh huh. And very often it gets shredded and mixed in with other things. Uh -huh. And so I found by adding some shredded zucchini in with the beef, you can really lighten it up and you get this, this really light summer weight meatloaf. There is a, a quick, the, uh, this may be the most complicated thing in the recipe. You cook down some tomatoes with a little bit of onions and garlic and a, a splash of vinegar to make kind of a quick tomato jam and fold that in. Mm -hmm. And that's your meatloaf. A little bit of Parmesan cheese, some panko breadcrumbs. But speaking of kids, I made four batches of this because I did a live demo the other night. And we needed one to come out of the oven uh -oh. at the end. I'm familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad took one of the extra pans when he went to visit my sister. And she and my niece and nephew finished the entire thing off with dad. They oh, it. it looks so, delicious. And, you know, um, I have to admit that I, um, with my... Uh, newfound like sort of menu program. I don't eat as much beef. I do eat beef, but I, I usually reserve it for a big old fatty, delicious bone in ribeye. So, but I would, I want to try this with turkey. And I think that the turkey and the zucchini would be, uh, would be really fantastic together. I can tell it has been done that way. Yeah. You mentioned substitutes earlier. And I always say people will come up to me and ask as if my recipe is, you know, the painting on the top of the Sistine Chapel can I make a substitute? And I always say to them, this is cooking. Like, this is not fine art, I, right? This is these, this recipe won't be around in 2,000 years. One of the joys of being an adult is we get to cook exactly what we want when we want it. So substitute <laughs> away. I have one exception to that, by the way. And that is that when you sit down at your mom's table, you will say thank you for whatever she puts down in front of you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That is that is the truth. That is the truth. Okay, y'all. For those of you that's jo just joining us, my guest is Jonathan Bardick. He is a chef, storyteller, and author out of the D.C. area. And um, his book is called Simple Summer. You can win a copy. I want you to head to my Instagram feed, and um, you're going to like me. If, even if you don't already like me, you can. Or if you don't, you do. Whatever. You just like me, like Jonathan tag a friend. And then on Monday, you will be entered to win um, a signed copy of Jonathan's book. And it's just all about some, I'm going to read you, I'm going to read y'all some of the, um, some of the recipes that are included. So it's like celebrate summer, simple joys, cold drinks, great music and cooking bright, fresh fruit food to share with those you love. Peach quesadillas, watermelon gazpacho, French potato and tomato salad. Ooh, I love that mashup. That sounds delicious. Um, spicy orange soy grilled shrimp, lemon poppy seed ricotta waffles. Oh my gosh, I have to eat lunch before I do these is what I think. Okay, grilled thick cut pork chops with a peach barbecue sauce. I have hardly ever met a pork chop I didn't like. Let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> this is one of the, uh, there, there are recipes that I come across that feel empowering, right? I think they make us feel special in the kitchen and sauces are very often in that category where you go, oh, wait a minute, you can make this at home? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. particularly with barbecue sauce, and, and I know that you have been doing some work with Weight Watchers over the last year, it's so easy for more sugars that need to end up, more salt that needs to end up in a lot of those sauces. So I thought I'd try making it at home. and. With summer peaches, when particularly the ones that are about five minutes from going bad, yeah, 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 yeah. They mash up so beautifully into this rich, thick, but still sweet, tangy barbecue sauce, and slathered over the a pork chop right at the end of grilling, it is magic. Oh gosh, I see a pork chop in my future, and you know you're right. And the other thing about making your own barbecue sauce, so my mama has made her own barbecue sauce since I was a child, like. Store-bought barbecue sauce was not a thing in, my, in mama's house or at my grandmother's house. It was just not a thing. And um, she, mama got the recipe from a neighbor in our neighborhood and when I was a little girl. And that just became our family's barbecue sauce. No crafts, no Heinz, no nothing. And, you know, it sounds like, oh, my gosh, why would you bother? Why would you bother? Because you can pronounce all the ingredients, right? Because you can control the amount of fat and sugar, and you and it and it's it's just a better product, right? You know, okay, mayonnaise, I get it. Who wants to make homemade mayonnaise every time you need some mayonnaise? But barbecue sauce. And then the other thing is, you know, there's enough uh, there's enough you know acid and, and sugar and things like that that it'll last 
It lasts right. a week plus, right? Like Mama's has a ton of vinegar in it, so it lasts even longer. But you know, you, I, I, what would you think about this? You've got molasses, ketchup, half a cup of white vinegar. I mean, I would very, very safely say that this would last what seven to ten days. I mean, I know it's on kind of on the edge. Easily. I mean, yeah. I'm so I, I would say seven to ten days for yeah. anyone that I gave it to. Yeah. Well, I will secretly admit I've had it in the fridge for a month and it yeah. passes the smell and all the other right. safety tests. No, I know. Right. I, I know. And I'm glad that you gave that caveat because like, you know, what and like what the lawyers would want me to do if I were going to put this in a magazine or you're going to put this in a magazine and they'd say three to five days. You and I know that it's probably seven to ten is fine. And I know that in my refrigerator, if I made a batch of this barbecue sauce, I would definitely keep it a month. Right. Because, yeah. you know, you just got to look. So Scott, who also um, has a wonderful book, Small Town Kitchen Table, he just ordered yours. So, Thank you, Scott. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's got a beautiful, great book with lots of great recipes. And um, Beverly says that all of these uh, recipes sound delicious. And then we have so, uh, Jennifer thinks that the zucchini loaf grounds great. And then she likes the turkey idea. So there you go. We've got some recipe development mm -hmm. happening. Um all right, so let's talk about um, let's talk about the storytelling aspect because I think that that's lovely that you describe yourself as a chef and a storyteller and an author. So tell tell us a little bit more about the storytelling aspect of simple 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 summer. For me, the the joy in food goes beyond just the dish, right? I, I love good food, but. The, the connections to to history, to family, to the people who grew it. You mentioned the barbecue sauce coming from a neighbor and then your mom made it growing up. That when, when I, I find, and I always say to people about farm markets, when I buy food from people I know, I never eat alone. Yeah. And so that's what the stories are there for me. They, they give the context that make these recipes special. I think they've also, you know, in, in 10 years of standing in front of audiences and talking a lot, um, it, it's given me the opportunity to think a lot about what food means in our life. So one of my favorite stories in the book, and my parents turned 70 years old, their, their birthdays are four months apart. They came to my brother, sister, and I and said, we don't want any party. We don't want any gifts. We just want an experience with you. And for me, they asked me to stand at the top of the Lincoln Steps uh, on the memorial in D.C., at sunrise and watch the sun come up with them. And oh. while we were there, we talked for a half an hour about everything we could do that day, going out for breakfast, going to the Museum of, of African-American History and Culture, walking down the mall, seeing the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden, sitting out and having coffee in the afternoon and, and talking about where our next trips would be, what my next book should be about. And by the time we got to the bottom of the steps a half an hour later, we had we'd cut you know most of that out we still had an amazing day but i have come to see those those long lazy breakfasts those summer breakfasts and brunches as these moments of pure possibility where oh, we, that's a beautiful expression right so we we have those big dreams and i think when we take the time to dream big we we create better aspirations for what we actually go out and do whether those aspirations are a hike or a visit to the farm market this afternoon uh, or whether they are the next book that you write or the right. next trip around the world that you take. That's a, that's really beautiful. And I'm, I'm so glad to get to have this conversation with you. I mean, I think a lot about that. You know, it's not just about like setting goals. You know, dreams are one thing. Goals are a little bit of another. They're not quite the same thing, but you got to put it sort of out into the universe. You got to put it out. You got to let it out of your mouth. Right. Right. That's the first thing. Like if you've got something in your head that you think that you make want to happen or you want to go somewhere or do something, I think that one of the most important things is like let the words come out of your mouth, let them leave your brain. And then I think the other thing is like you just like you just said, it was like a perfect description. Like y'all talked about all the things that you wanted to do and you didn't do all of them. But that doesn't mean that that was a failure. That means that you just sort of self-corrected. Right. You realize yeah. that. It's at some level, if we do all these things, it's going to be too much and it's going to be unenjoyable, right? But if we choose this, this, and this, what a lovely day, right? So it's 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 evolving all the time. And some of the dreaming is part of the fun, right? right. I mean, if you, if you sit down with your mom for lunch today 
and say, what should we have for dinner? You'll talk about 15 dishes and you will think about, well, how about this one we had and we went to that restaurant? And how about this one we had and we were together with family? And how about the one that, you know, my sibling always loved when I was growing up? And, and by the end, you're going to pick one dish. But all of that storytelling, all of those memories, that experience itself is, is worth it before you even get to the table. There's a, there's a thought that I share in my TV show, which is this thing that I call a joy premium. Oh. So in investing, uh, there's a concept called a risk premium. The riskier uh -huh. an investment, the higher the return you want. And I think the opposite exists. And, and I think it's particularly important in food, which is a joy premium. So the more joy you can load into an experience, the less important the outcome is. So if I go to a farm market and I get to buy food from people I know and I'm, I'm hearing about their kids and smiling and it's a beautiful day and it's a beautiful place and I get home and I share time with friends and family in the kitchen, the meal that ends up on the table, whether it's good or not, doesn't matter at that point because I've had all of this joy. If I, I, you know, if I just swing by the grocery store and throw a few things in a bag, the food better taste good because that's the sum total of that experience. That is so beautiful. That is, oh my gosh, I just love, I love your, love your philosophy. That's fantastic. So, and you really bring that into this book. You really bring it into Simple Summer that, you know, it really is about the joy and the pleasure of experiencing summer. And I think that that's the, one of the things that, that I know that I like, move my table. Um, I know that I like the most about um, summer is that the food is so simple, right? So that you can, spend the chef, the cook can spend more time with friends and family because it's so easy to cook. You know what I mean? It's like it kind of cooks itself and it's just less stressful in a way. Um, and I, so I love that you talk about you have drink recipes, but you also just give suggestions about like, hey, heavy beer may not work today. Or, you know, you've got the watermelon martini and I've got some like some interesting things and and the music. And you it really is a cookbook that's um, it's it's an entertaining cookbook as much as it is. Um, it's an entertaining cookbook as much as it is as like a, a group of recipes. Right. Again, I, I think sharing time together is such a big part of summer. And, you know, we're, we're outdoors. It's easier to do it. You don't have to cram everyone in your dining room. You don't have to set a fancy table. And so it, it's such a perfect time to just say, uh, you know, on the spur of the moment, come over to the house, share yeah. time, your friends, your family. And, and so the music helps set that little background. Um, I, again, I get asked so often about what do I serve with this for a drink? Yeah. When I wrote it, I, when somebody asks you a question, I feel like the goal is to make their life less stressful by the time you've an finished answering it. Right. And sitting down and giving them a specific bottle and a vintage is not taking stress out of anyone's life. Not really. So I tried to make suggestions where you can go into your local liquor store or you can even go to your grocery store or your market and just say, hey, Jonathan said that a nice crisp rosé is going to be great with some of this food. Tell me what you have on the shelf and hand me a bottle. And, yeah. and so you, you feel like you're making a more informed choice. But you don't feel like you had to do a whole lot of work for it. And no, 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 no. It's all about, I think also, too, like no one who wants stress. And then the other thing that's great, I mean, it's a little bit less problematic in the in the Northeast. But, you know, we've got some we've got some COVID again. Right. So outdoor entertaining is, I think, the way to go. It's the smart way to go. Um, everybody just everybody's vaxxed or not. Right. But get vaxxed. But, you know, uh, outdoor entertaining. Get outside. Even here at night, like it's it's in the upper 80s, but if you're you got a fan going and it's still, um, yeah. it can be really it can still be really enjoyable. So, well, I have got some questions for you that I like to ask everybody, and I want to start out with what is one of your favorite food memories? One of my favorite food memories is a dish that my mom would always make growing up. So it's zucchini season. Anyone who's ever grown zucchini or lived next to someone who has grown zucchini <laughs> knows that even one plant will produce more than any family. Way more, yeah. Do. So, and and my mom is a thrifty New Englander. You know that you've met some thrifty New Englanders. So if it was coming out of the garden, by gosh, she was not going to go to the grocery store and spend more money on vegetables. 
But with three kids growing up, at a certain point, we're starting to get a little bored of all these zucchini dishes. Mm -hmm. And she discovered zucchini pancakes. Think of a, a latka. Mm. Zucchini mixed with a little bit of cheese, egg, and some corn or potato starch to bind it. Mm. Uh, fresh flavor with a little bit of basil, maybe a pinch of cayenne in there just to brighten things up. And so there are two recipes in the book, actually, that are based on this. There is my wow. mom's traditional zucchini pancakes. And then a few years ago, I, I developed a variation that turned into kind of its own recipe where I mix it with fresh corn off the cob and make a real simple cilantro crema. And yeah. crema is not always the easiest thing to find, but you can always find sour cream or creme fraiche. Yes, yes, yes. So you just puree a whole bunch of cilantro with your uh, with your creme fraiche, drizzle that over the top, and then just to make sure you taste the sweetness of the corn and the zucchini, a little drizzle of honey over the top. Oh, yummy. That sounds so nice. Oh, that sounds so nice. I might have to might have to add some of that into my uh, my, my meal this weekend. Um, so we not only made these, mom not only made these for us as kids, but I had a night alone up here with my mom last night. I said, what do you want me to cook for dinner? And she said, zucchini pancakes. So oh, yeah, I, I actually yeah. opened up Simple Summer and made the recipe right out of there for my mom last night. Oh, that's so beautiful. Don't you love cooking with your mom? That's one of my favorite things on earth to do. That's so great. Um, does she fuss at you too about making too many dishes? Yes, always. <laughs> mom of Virginia B. Willis, I'm not alone. Um, okay. So way, I if anyone noticed the sudden light change, uh, I am I'm visiting our neighbors um, because they're coming back from vacation today. So I'm sneaking uh -huh. some zucchini into their house uh -huh. and their cats just ran past the corn. Oh, no, no worries. No worries. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's too funny. They're like, what are you doing here? Um, <laughs> all right. So I know that as a chef, I'm inspired by a lot of different things. Every bite I put in my mouth. I would love for you to tell everybody, like, who are some of the people that inspired you? What was the last cookbook that you cooked from or read other than your own, other than Simple Summer? I read, I have a good friend, Amy Riolo, who is also based Yay! in Washington, yeah. food, right? Mediterranean food and culture expert. And we had a whole bunch of seafood at the house that I needed to use up. So I opened her uh, American Diabetes Association yeah. Mediterranean Diet Cookbook. And she had a great seafood stew. I will tell you, I normally don't cook directly from recipes. And yeah. I'm guessing you probably do the same thing. When you're used to, when you know enough food and you're used to just throwing things in, it can feel tedious the first time making a recipe. Yeah. Feels like work. I get inspired by a lot of a lot of different recipes, but this was the first one in a while that I cooked start to finish. It was also incredibly simple and delicious. That's nice. And you know, it's nice sometimes because I do do some work that I test other people's recipes, and I love that. You know, I love the um, it's work, which is why I don't normally like to do it, right? But sometimes I really enjoy it because you're learning from other people, and Amy is awesome. So yay you on that note. Okay, so. That's the book that you like to, that's the most recent book. Who is someone that you like in terms of content, like video content on TV, on your, on your phone, on your iPad, whatever, like, and it can be YouTube to PBS to Reverie, whatever. Who is someone that you like to watch? Gosh, who have I been watching lately? Um, I mean, I, Kenji Lopez-Alt is mm -hmm. always incredible. Yeah. There is a, a great podcast that I have started listening oh, yeah. to yeah, yeah, yeah. here called uh, Chefs Without Restaurants. Oh, cool. Uh, it is, it's uh, produced by a private chef, mm -hmm. and he interviews, he's interviewed some amazing folks, in, including uh, Daniel, who's now the editor over at Series Eats. Yeah, uh, yeah. He did a, for his 100th episode, he did a two-part interview with him, but he interviews people who are in the food industry, but aren't technically doing restaurant work. Yeah, so no, that's, a, that's theaters, a big question, right? developers. Yeah, no, that's cool. And, and I think that's good because there's a, there's a ton of us out there, right? Like, I mean, yeah. we may have worked in restaurants in the past, but we're no longer working in restaurants. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that you can do in this world in the culinary field other than work mm -hmm. in restaurants. Um, so that's really cool. I'll, thank you. That's a, such a selfish question because it's, I love to check out 
like check out what people are saying. The one right. other person I think you would love is uh, David, and I am, I don't pronounce, uh, I don't know Portuguese well, so I'm going to butcher this, but it's, I think it's Huimares. It's G U I M A R E S. Uh huh. He is the executive chef at the European Union Embassy in Washington, D.C. He was moly. Portuguese and was trained over there and started a podcast during COVID and has had amazing, amazing people on it. I mean, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I have to um, add that. Podcasting, um, is, podcasting is a whole other thing. Uh, I think he actually has Jacques Pepin on recently. I mean, he just keeps pulling these that's unbelievable it, names. So that's awesome. Both really fun to listen to. All right, Terry says, nothing like summer veggies. That is the truth. Okay, sour, salty, bitter, sweet, or savory? What's your go-to flavor? Absolutely savory. Yeah, yeah. Umami. So what, are your I, what are some of your favorite umami yeah. things? Uh, I love going for red miso is probably my my silver bullet. So um, yeah. Deborah Madison, uh, who wrote Vegetarian for Everyone and uh -huh. Vegetable Literacy, right? Yep. Wonderful vegetarian chef. Vegetable I, literacy is genius. Oh, it, amazing book. My probably 12 years ago, my husband Jason and I went vegetarian. It was a great three months. We, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, you've probably been here before. What's right? a great you afternoon. Get bored with everything that you've been doing and you just, you go find like a brand new cuisine or a new culture to cook from yeah. just to shake it up. So that's where, that that's why we went vegetarian. And Deborah Madison's Vegetarian for Everyone was kind of my go-to. Yeah, and I yeah, learned so cool. much. I, I grew up on a lot of vegetarian food because mom was bringing in so much from the garden. The, yeah, yeah. Um, the moose wood cook. That's it. Plant forward, yeah. right? You know, plant forward is the way to go. Okay. So with all these summer vegetables, I just have to ask you, what is your most indispensable cooking tool? Well, I guess indispensable cooking tool year round. What is, what is your most indispensable cooking tool? Um, I often give two answers to everything, if I may. <laughs> uh, number one, <clears throat> and I know this because of doing a lot of live cooking demonstrations. When you have to pack your kitchen and travel somewhere uh, and, and set up a pop-up kitchen to do a demo, yeah. you learn very quickly what is essential. So the, the only thing I've literally never been able to work without is a knife. Yeah. Uh, I even put a, a tea towel over a sheet pan once to use as a cutting board. So, so the yeah. knife is a good knife is indispensable, and I, it, it's a it's a bit of a funny answer, but I think the truth is that we use the knife more than any utensil that we use in the kitchen, and yeah. the more comfortable we get with using a knife, particularly a chef's knife, the more work we can get done in a shorter period of time with less effort. Great. So, having a really good knife makes all the difference. After that, I am gonna and. I get asked about this all the time when people see my kitchen is a salt pig. So a salt. Oh, oh a salt pig. A I salt pig. A so a salt what? pig is a, a little, you, uh, mm -hmm. you probably have one. Is, yep, is yep, a piece yep. of crop, crockery with an open mouth. And in fact, the, the pig in salt pig refers to a Scottish word for crockery. Whoa, nice. That's a so, good, I didn't know that. Thank you for yeah. dropping that knowledge on me. So you live in the humid South, just like I do in DC. Yeah. I've had a salt pig on my counter for 12 years with that open mouth, and I've never had salt plump. That's I don't know awesome. what the magic is, but yeah. when you're seasoning to taste, just being able to reach in and get a pinch, put it in the pan, not yeah. have to take a lid off, particularly if your hands are messy, yeah. magic. No, that's cool. That's good. Oh, my gosh, what great answers. Like I told you, well, you're actually, oddly, the first person that said knife, which I've always been astonished at because I, I, I thought I was going to get nothing but knife. Um, but, a, but a salt pig, that is the most, that is a very interesting one. And I love that. I love that because salt is so important, um, for bringing out the flavors of food. Jonathan, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on today. Um, your book is absolutely beautiful. Um, congratulations, congratulations on your, on your television show. That's fantastic. And, um, thank you so much for being a part of Cookbooks with Virginia. Virginia, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Yay, 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 yay. Well, listen, um, I'll see you this around on social media as we promote your book over the weekend, okay? Wonderful. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Yes, yes. Y'all, isn't that fun? Isn't that wonderful? I am just as happy as I can be. Um, Jonathan Bardick's uh, Simple Summer, beautiful book. 
uh, color photography, tons of recipes, music, stories, recipes, everything you need to have a great summer party. Um, so thank you so much for watching Cookbooks with Virginia today. Um, lots of great things happening. You can check it out at my website. Um, I'm now doing live cooking classes for Food Network Kitchen. My next episode is on Tuesday the 17th. So this next Tuesday um, at 8 p.m. So you can uh, you can give it a watch. And I believe that I am doing um, summer vegetable stuffed roasted tomatoes. It's a delicious, good and good for you dish. So for more about it, um, check out uh, my website, virginiawills.com. Um, for more information about Jonathan and Simple Summer, go to jonathanbarzik.com. Um, thanks so much for watching, y'all. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and healthy, and um, bon appetit, y'all. All right. Bye-bye now.